Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'd like to call the general meeting of the GPICA of September 2nd, 2020 to order. It's 6.32 p.m. on a Wednesday night. Um, uh, I, I, is there a way that everybody can get an agenda? We were talking about a way to do that. Yes. Okay. Um, I will. Uh, yeah, let, I, I'd like uh, Helen to just bring us up to speed on the technical aspects of this. Go ahead, Helen. Oh. It's all yours. It's Scott, uh, I'll drop it in the chat right now. Okay. I thought I had it, but. I don't know what to do. No, you don't have to do anything. It's me that. Uh, yeah, it's not coming up. I'm sorry. Okay, here it is in the chat. And um, we can start up at the top for the agenda. Okay? Oh, yeah. Can Those everybody of you see like this? me, chat's the little button down at the bottom. Yeah, the chat should, should just have come up for everybody. So maybe, uh, maybe um, you want to read read it for the people who might not be seeing this all Scott? right um uh, we have about nine items call to order presentation by the pine island pine island pandemic task force moderated by pastor eric mccray uh number three is a public hearing uh, presented by dan stovall president of haunch docks and lifts regarding a permit application to build a 978 square foot boathouse that's the roof measurements at 30, 30, 3737 San Carlos Boulevard in St. James City. Uh, I see Sherry's on board. She's going to give us a treasurer's report. Uh, I think we can bring the minutes of the previous GPICA general meeting up on the chat uh, at the appropriate time. And our last general meeting was in person. That was on March 3rd. Uh, I'll give an update on the water test thing at Tropical Point Beach. I was out there last Friday and we have the results back. Uh, number seven, an update on the public hearing for a variance to build a 110 foot Doppler radar pole tower in St. James City. Uh, I'll give an update on the proposed docks behind Captain Cons. Actually, and this is a note Captain Cons has nothing to do with the docks. And uh, finally, uh, best for last, an update on incorporation. That's it. Okay, thank you, Scott. I can uh, pull up the minutes if you would like. Well, let's do it when we get to that. I okay. Think, yeah. I thought we were. Helen, you want to go ahead and uh, tell us how this is going to work tonight? Okay. Um, I have muted just about everybody. I'm going through and muting. Yeah. I think Dan I, is still I, active. I'm or sorry. Did you just him? Dan Stobo, he keeps he keeps flipping back and forth in my view. Um, I I see his name and it's not flipping on my screen. Okay. Okay. So I I'm not muting Scott or myself, but I've muted everybody else. Um, if you want to uh, say something, just unmute yourself by holding down the space bar, and talking while the space bar is pressed down, or on the bottom left of your screen, you'll see the unmute uh, um, icon, and you can unmute yourself that way. Um, this, uh, this meeting is being recorded, and the, I, I believe we're gonna, have, we're gonna put up the recording of the meeting on our website, is that correct, Nadine? Yeah? That's correct. Yeah, okay. And uh, when we get to the presentations, uh, we're, we have some very interesting presentations tonight, and I know you will have questions. So what we would like to do is for you to put your questions in the chat box. The chat box you can find at the bottom, the middle of the bottom of your screen, if you're on a, a, a computer or a laptop. And uh, you you uh, click on the chat and then make sure that it's going to everyone, all right? It's not going to a specific person, it's going to everyone. And then just type your question in the chat. You don't have to wait till people are finished. You can do it while they're talking. And we're going to wait until all four presenters 
have finished their presentations and then take questions, if that's okay with everybody. Sounds good. Okay, all right. Um, yeah. Other than that, uh, we may be voting on some items later in the evening. We don't have a quorum, so we can't vote. We don't have a quorum at this point. Okay. Well, yeah. we, don't, we have, well, it's 20 members. We got more than 20 people. And more people may uh, sign on in the next few minutes. Uh, if it comes to that, if we are voting on something, um, I think probably the easiest way to do it is by roll call. And I think Scott will take care of that by just starting with the person in the upper left hand corner of his screen and moving through all the uh, participants. Now, um, Nadine has the list of current members. Yeah, you do have to be a member to vote. So I know um, at that, least, that, you know, a couple of you may not be. You have to be a member to vote on elections and on money issues, but ah. community interest issues, okay. such as, you know, variances and so forth. We get a couple of those tonight. You just have to be a member of the community. Okay, so, so anybody, anybody, can vote. anybody can vote. Um, if you would like to be recognized by me, if you have some urgent thing that's not a question or something like thing, things aren't working or something, just wave your hand. Oops, you can't really see me wave my hand because of my funny background, but just wave your hand at me and I will see you and I'll, I'll try to resolve your problem. Alternatively, you can write to me in the chat function by just putting in Helen Fox, private message to Helen Fox, and then I'll see it come up. Okay, I think that's um, probably about it. Okay, thank you, Helen. Uh, I'd like to introduce the uh, pastor of the Methodist Church here on Pine Island, Eric McRae. He's gonna moderate mm -hmm. the the uh, Pine Island Pandemic Task Force, which is an ad hoc group uh, that was put together a couple of months ago to try to deal with issues of local concern regarding the COVID-19 virus. So, Pastor, it's all yours. All right, thank you, Scott. Um, as he said, uh, we got together. I was invited uh, to join a, a group of people who were um, having a meeting about uh, what we could possibly do uh, to help um, with the COVID-19 pandemic uh, locally. Um, and so I was asked to come to a meeting and um, at the first meeting I was elected the leader. <laughs> Sometimes happens. Um, but um, we uh, established at the beginning um, two basic uh, things that we wanted to work towards, and I think we've kind of added a third along the way. Uh, first is that we want to provide uh, good information regarding uh, the, the pandemic and uh, how people can get resources. And to that end, um, there was a Facebook page, uh, Pine Island Pandemic Community Action page, which um, my guess is that several of you already are members of that, but if you're not, uh, you can look it up on Facebook and, um, and join. And we try to uh, keep that a non-political discussion. Uh, we just want it to be focused on good information. Uh, and then the other uh, goal that we set at the beginning was that we would try and coordinate um, the resources uh, because the island has a lot of different organizations of which uh, this organization is one and that's why we're so glad to have Scott involved with our task force. Um, and uh, to see what we can do to cooperate, facilitate cooperation between uh, all the many organizations on the island to help get Islanders resources related to the pandemic. Um, and then the, the third thing that's sort of been added along the way is we've sort of uh, become uh, an advocacy group for the, the uh, residents of the island uh, for things like trying to get testing on the island which happened a couple weeks ago and we're trying to get them to come back and um, also uh, having dialogues with our elected leaders uh, about um, uh, getting us resources and paying attention to us on the island so those are sort of our aims 
Um, tonight we have, uh, as has already been said, uh, a couple of different speakers. Uh, and the first is uh, Claudia Bringe, who is going to share firsthand information, uh, not only what it's like to have COVID-19, um, but also uh, to have a family member uh, who had COVID-19. And so at this point, I wanna uh, introduce Claudia to the group. Thank you. Uh, I never did have COVID-19. I, I don't know. Anyway, I want to talk about my brother-in-law, Mike Kimmel, who was, we lost Mike Kimmel on Good Friday of this year. He was a CPA in a large firm in Atlanta, and it was at the very beginning of this pandemic. Um, he started with what appeared to be a bad cold. He um, stayed at home, he brought home his work, and for a week he was with a cold. Um, towards the end of that week, he started having nausea, and by the end of the week, he could not keep any food down. So my sister called an ambulance, and they took, put him in the ambulance, and my sister never saw him again. Um, when he got to the hospital, the good news was there was no infection in his lungs. Um, they were due to celebrate their 51st anniversary. Um, <clears throat> he was at Kennestone Hospital, which is, excuse me, which is in Marietta, Georgia. The doctors and the nurses there did everything they could. He was put on a ventilator shortly after he was admitted. Uh, it, it progressed that quickly. Um, for three weeks, they tried everything, but the virus affected his kidneys, his heart, his lungs, and his brain. And at the end of the three weeks, the doctor talked to my sister and said, we can keep him on the ventilator, but it's basically life support. And of course, Di and Mike had filled out um, uh, wills and they decided to take him off life support and he died with the nurse holding his hand on Good Friday. Mm. Wow. <clears throat> Claudia, we really appreciate you sharing that. Um, that's, uh, I know that was hard for you and your family. Um, did you all get to do any kind of um, remembrance of his life and, or anything like that? You know, I'm not really sure at this point what my sister is going to do because there have been so many deaths. It has taken her so long just to get a death certificate. Uh, she is trying to make arrangements to sort her life out. And I don't know, you know, the firm that he worked for, I'm sure we wanted to do something too. But I don't know at this point because Atlanta still has spikes going on whether they're going to do anything or not. Yeah, that's just a certain, certainly uh, a lot of the people that I'm aware of, that's one of the struggles is that families aren't able to, to do the normal thing when you, when they lose one of their loved ones. And um, so I know that just makes a, a, a bad situation even harder. Um, anything else that you would like to share uh, with the group about, um, uh, about your experience or the experience of your family? I don't really think there's anything else to say. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much uh, for sharing that. Um, uh, just want to remind you what Helen said, that if you do have questions, um, uh, just type those in the, the chat box and we will try to respond to them at the end. Uh, next, we have Katie, who's going to share some witnesses from uh, some nurses uh, who have treated COVID patients. Good evening, everyone. My name is Katie Largay. Um, I've been a registered nurse for over 45 years. I'm uh, retired now, but uh, was a bedside nurse and worked in many specialties, uh, worked in administration. I have a bachelor's degree from Cornell University in nursing and a master's degree from Columbia University in public health with a specialty in administration and epidemiology. Um, 
at the beginning of this pandemic, nurses across the country started a group called Nursing Strong with the purpose of being able to share information um, about COVID-19, how it was presenting itself and what their individual work experiences were like. What I've done is I've pulled off um, a testimony from one of these nurses who was sharing her experience as a hospice nurse uh, taking care of COVID patients and their families. And that's what I'm gonna to read to you tonight. I'm a hospice nurse. I work in an inpatient hospice center. These days, since healthcare is now considered a battleground, I would be considered the last stop, the last stop on the front lines. I've been working in hospice for seven years and have been working with end of life patients in some capacity for my entire nursing career. I am no stranger to death and I'm not afraid of it. I have helped hundreds if not thousands of people die and I have been impacted in some way by every single one. Over the past four months, I have watched dozens of people die from COVID-19. Countless people, perfect strangers, people from my community, parents and grandparents of people I know and love, of people you know and love, some that were sick and declining before they got COVID, some that were not. I have listened to the sound that breath makes when it struggles in and out of a person's dying body because their airways are swollen and inflamed with this virus. I've watched bodies produce so much fluid in response to this virus that it spills out of them, pours out of their mouth and nose. I've watched people recover from the respiratory symptoms only to have their muscles rendered so weak, so useless that they can no longer eat, that their mouths and throats and stomachs no longer know what to do with food. I have admitted people so swollen from weeks of prone venting that their eyeballs and tongues protrude from their bodies. I've watched the rise and fall of my patient's chest on baby monitors to check if they're still breathing because it is too dangerous for us to spend hours at the bedside the way we normally would with a patient whose family could not be present. On the first day of quarantine, I sat with my husband and cried, trying to wrap my mind around knowing that our unit was the only one now allowing visitors and the visitation would be severely restricted. Knowing that in many cases, I would be the last person to see my patients alive knowing that this part of my job had become simultaneously more important and more difficult. I have talked with family members on the phone to describe how and why their loved one is dying, to tell them how much time is left. I've listened to them agonize over their decision to not come in for their loved one's final days because they or someone in their household is high risk for complications with the virus. I have the same conversation with them day after day as they make this terrible decision until the very last moment. I have led family members into rooms to see their dying mother, father, sister, brother, best friend, their loved one who was not dying the last time anyone from their family saw them before the quarantine began. I watched them take turns with their family members to honor the visitor policy and know that they will never again sit in the same room all together as a family. I have sat in these rooms and held phones and tablets up to my dying patients so that their family members can talk to their now unresponsive body, so they can share memories of a life well lived and loved, so they can say I'm sorry, so they can say thank you. I spent moments, hours, days so scared, so terrified for my own life and that of my family that I was left debilitated, unable to move, unable to stop crying, unable to believe that my choices were to abandon my vocation or walk to my own death. It took weeks and weeks to recover from the trauma of watching the rules change every hour, every day on how we should protect ourselves as healthcare professionals, to realize how unprepared we were as a nation, as a healthcare community, how dispensable I felt. I'm still recovering. I may never recover all the way. Every single nurse I know will have PTSD from this. Every single person working in healthcare, millions of Americans, millions of people, as we watch as the use of masks has become a political weapon. We listen to you complain that you don't like the way it feels or regurgitate some article about CO2 buildup as we stare in the mirror at the indents and bruises that wearing two masks for 13 hours straight have made our faces. We listen to you repeat fallacies and how this disease is being tested, reported, tracked, 
and listen to you quote scientifically inaccurate statistics about the efficacy of masks from some article you read on Facebook. We listen to you state that those with immunocompromised bodies who have cancer or heart disease or COPD or diabetes are not your problem. We listen to you both that you cannot be a sheep. We silently sit as you tell us that this is all part of a scheme to control our minds. We listen to you tell us you respect our work, that you could never do what we're doing, and then continue railing against the very measures to keep us safe. I will tell you that I reach you to share my truth with you in hopes that maybe one day one person will make one decision differently. I tell you this way you remember to be safe. Make smart choices, wear a mask in public. Do not go places just because you can. Be purposeful in your decisions and finding the balance between your mental and emotional needs and your safety. Because in the end, it comes down to grief. We're all grieving, the entire world is grieving. The sooner we acknowledge what we are dealing with, the easier it will be to connect with each other again. I am grieving too, but I am not your hero. All right, thank you, Katie. Um, next up is uh, Carrie Frashauer. She is a teacher, um, not only a teacher, but she is a, um, a mother of several uh, kids uh, in the school system. And so my guess is she's having quite a, re a week <laughs> uh, this week, uh, with school starting yesterday. Um, Carrie, will you tell us a little bit about um, your position and um, uh, how it's going? Hey, can okay, I jump uh, in for a second, you Eric? Can, sure. You can hold on for a minute. I sure. need to cancel or mute or stop the recording. Right. Just pause it, uh, Helen. Just do pause. Yeah, just pause. It's at the, uh, should no, be on the bottom sorry. bar there. Um, yeah, yeah, if you look at your little button, you'll be able to see. Great. A duck, Gary. <laughs> All right, so um, are we back on? Yes. Because I definitely want um, this part recorded. Okay. Um, ne next up is uh, Dr. James Coatman, uh, and I just love this man. I'd only known him for a couple of months, but um, I learned something every time I talk to him. He is an epidemiologist. He'll tell you a, a little bit about his, his experience, which is extensive. But he's going to try and outline for you uh, some of the current issues and also uh, maybe some of the things that are coming down the pike. So thanks, Dr. Jim. Well, uh, th thank you, Eric. Uh, it's been a very great pleasure working with Eric. Uh, I am an MD epidemiologist. I was, uh, you know, started my training for this career in the 60s. And, and I'm uh, in the early 70s, I worked on smallpox eradication, where we did the kind of contact tracing uh, that was successful in eliminating smallpox. Uh, 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 later, it, uh, uh, after doing a pediatrics residency, uh, uh, I then worked in Latin America a lot uh, uh, as an epidemiologist. And, and then um, I became assistant professor at the University of Michigan, uh, where I have been professor for more than 40 years. And I'm retired now uh, uh, completely. But uh, uh, in uh, 2003, uh, one of the things I did, was I went to Beijing for the SARS epidemic there in uh, Beijing. Uh, uh, and I was able to uh, do an analysis that helped them understand what they, what they had done and what, what they needed to do. Uh, I've been working on uh, the COVID epidemic uh, since it started. I, I was fully retired. Uh, but then I realized that I had special things to do. And so uh, actually today I've just finished a paper that I think is going to have an important uh, contribution to the final control of the epidemic. So I, I, I just, so much has happened and I, I don't want to go into what's happened. I want to think 
how we get going forward from here. Uh, we, we, we can't cry over spilt milk that we've failed so much as we've failed. Uh, 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 we've got to find ways to start moving ahead. Uh, 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 one thing is to, to really understand the nature of this uh, uh, virus. When it started, we thought, oh, this is going to be just like the SARS, the 2003 SARS. But indeed, uh, that was not the case. Uh, uh, in this disease, this is 2003 SARS, it was such a relief that we were able to stop that epidemic because it had such a very high fatality rate and it was very contagious and it was almost got completely out of control. But great effort by great people got it under control and, and, and put it into it. Most countries then got well prepared for it. And, and the United States started getting well prepared for the, for the next such epidemic. But a few years ago, they, they dropped that preparation. Uh, this, this epidemic is very different than the 2000 SARS, just with early transmission rather than late transmission. We have airborne transmission rather than droplet and, and surface transmission. Uh, just like the first epidemic, we have very highly uh, uh, variable contagiousness. The, about 10% of cases cause 80% of transmissions, 80% of new caught cases. So, so most infections are not so infectious, but some are highly infectious. And the difference between what makes it uh, 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 highly contagious or not is not just the physiology of what's happening into the person but also the social environment. Uh, 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 indeed, if you're in the, the classic uh, 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 case in, in Seattle where there was a choir and, and one infected person was singing and, and infected almost everybody else, uh, 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 you know, it's, it's, it's a social situation combined with a, a particular uh, uh, physiologic situation. The, the surprise has been how transmissible this is amongst asymptomatic or presymptomatic people. Uh, 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 one of the characteristics of this virus is when it escapes immune control, it damages very diverse tissues. I, I, I thought, you know, the, the uh, uh, letter that, that Katie read, uh, you know, was, uh, typical of that. When it, uh, 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 the other thing of it is, it can cause the immune system to do us harm. And what's making those differences are the immune status of the people in terms of what kind of infections they've had in the past and how, the, how those different infections they've had in the past are setting them up to, to have different kinds of responses. It's, it's not like just one overall characteristic. In, most of us old people have had so much experience with lo different infections that it helps set us up to uh, uh, turn the virus against ourselves. So thinking about you know, what's coming up now. Uh, 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 in the near future, we're gonna start into a high coronavirus season. There's no reason to believe that this coronavirus is going to behave much differently than the other uh, uh, endemic coronaviruses. Uh, uh, we, we can't be sure that it is, but it looks like it. And, and we, the first indications of seasonality uh, are consistent with that. Uh, uh, the, the endemic coronaviruses, they just cause the common cold. Uh, uh, before uh, uh, the SARS epidemic, we knew about two of them. Now we know about two more. And all four of those are the most extremely seasonal of uh, uh, infectious diseases. Very sharp seasonality that goes up in the fall. And that's one thing that has a lot of people worried, that, the, that in the fall, the, the seasonality will start again. Uh, uh, we're making some slow progress of getting better treatments. The monoclonal antibodies uh, uh, are looking good. All the steroids that you've been hearing about, the, even the, 
you know, the, some of the common steroids, doctors are yearning to use them better. But boy, there's, there's no magic bullet that's going to uh, end that. And the, the big thing that we're all looking forward to is vaccines. Uh, but, uh, and, the, and that's also my focus. Uh, my focus in developing the, the work that I've done is, is uh, to understand the immune system and how the virus escapes the immune system and how that can change over time. And, and so, uh, um, you know, when, when we think about vaccines, some people are really, really encouraged and they think, oh, it's gonna be such a great thing. But if you, if you think about our past experience with a lot of vaccines, I, I, people might not remember the 1976 swine flu uh, uh, that caused the Guillain-Barre syndrome. Uh, 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 boy, we didn't see that coming. We got so enthusiastic. We said, let's get, get out, get there, get the vaccine out. And then, well, suddenly we had this big problem. And it could be the same with these uh, 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 different vaccines that are being developed. So it's really important that we, we do the trials and do the trials right especially since we have you know, 88 different ones that are being developed at the current time. And we don't wanna choose the wrong one, uh, which would be a, a disastrous. But the other thing about the vaccine is we've gotta get everybody to, to participate. And it only looks like 40 or 50% of the people are willing to participate. So, so that's, that's gonna be a problem. Uh, 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 so highly variable uh, responses of, of different people uh, 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 can, can be caused by sometimes their past history with other coronaviruses. So what should we do now? Well, the first thing is we have to understand where we are now. And by that, I mean, if you think of the natural course of what the epidemic would have been if we hadn't, uh, um, you know, had the lockdown and, and decreased the, the, the transmission, uh, how many people would we have uh, 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 infected and how many could we still get infected because we haven't reached the level of herd immunity? Just let me talk a second about herd immunity. With this, with this infection, we have to talk about different regimens that we've been through. You know, when, when we, when we, uh, got this in initial lockdown, boy, we drove the uh, uh, transmission way down so that in a sense, we had enough herd immunity that we could keep it from spreading too much, except in some places like New York City. Uh, 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 but there's no way that, that we can uh, get to a level of herd immunity in this population, in our overall population, where we can open up relatively fully without there being a million or several million more deaths. We're that distant from, from the, the level of herd immunity. Of course, I, 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 we can get herd immunity for the, ex, for the, the way we're uh, uh, doing right now, but you know, come the fall, it may be that we're above that level of herd immunity. And so we need to be prepared uh, 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 if things get completely out of control to get things back in control again. Uh, 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 what we wanna do is minimize the virus transmission and the economic damage, you know? Uh, uh, we wanna get the virus levels down to New York state levels, at least. I mean, there's no chance that we're gonna get get down to, you know, uh, uh, Taiwan or South Korea or China levels. Uh, 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 we're, we're beyond any chance of that. The virus is way too far spread and it's gonna take way too much to bring it down uh, 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 to very low levels. And we just haven't gotten organized to do that. And we're not gonna be getting organized to do that, it looks like. So we got to, pick up the best we can do. 
We've got to open up in a manner that allows us to measure the effects of opening up on virus transmission. So we can say which things are creating what kind of problems, opening up the schools that we just talked about is one of the issues that we have to look at most carefully. Uh, uh, even though up to this time, it looks like the small kids under five are not uh, having much role in transmission. It's possible that the slightly older kids are gonna play a big role in transmission. And, and uh, 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 we don't want them to set off the situation where we're gonna have these millions of deaths, uh, which is quite possible. Uh, 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 what we want, there's another tactic that we can use, and that's trying to uh, identify large outbreaks. You know, we've talked about contact tracing a lot. And our original concept of contact tracing uh, 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 was, uh, uh, you know, keep people from getting out and, and uh, spreading their infection around by identifying their infections earlier. And if there were a contact, of somebody that you knew they were possible, put them in, in, in quarantine so that they won't infect other people. But I talked earlier about the, the fact that, you know, we have these big transmission episodes and we need to be able to understand those. So we need to think of the contact tracing as backward contact tracing. We, it, when we start having positive cases, we need to find the source cases of those positive cases and, and identify in, from those source cases the situations that cause the transmission where we can then intervene. I'm afraid in the state of Florida, we're not very well organized to do that yet, but we could be. Uh, uh, there's still uh, time to get organized to do something like that. I don't want to carry on too long. I think we should uh, open up to questions then. <clears throat> okay. Um, well, one of the questions, yeah, one of the questions we had from Mike earlier uh, was, will the task force be working on a vaccination program for Pine Islanders since a large proportion of Pine Islanders are over 65, uh, where 90% of the deaths are, come, are, are from? Um, certainly, we would want to uh, do what we could to help people, especially the most vulnerable people, get vaccines. So um, we, we will we'll be looking that, at, at that as vaccines are announced and begin to, the programs begin to run. Jim, did you want to say anything else about that? Yeah, I'll just, just, just to think that uh, um, we got to get organized at various levels, but one of the Key levels, for, even for starting the vaccine, is making sure that we have a good surveillance system because uh, uh, we want to start the vaccine use as soon as we can, but we want to be able to pick up problems with it as soon as possible too. And this is a conflict for the public health people. Uh, uh, in order to get everybody to participate, you know, you don't want to emphasize the potential problems. But on the other hand, uh, we know uh, that these, that some of the vaccines, at least, and in likelihood, most of them are going to be doing some good. Uh, 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 whether they're going to be our answer is another question. But uh, uh, we need to be able to find out who's getting vaccinated, who's not getting vaccinated, and how the vaccine is uh, affecting transmission. And, uh, you know, as a community, we need to be open about revealing such data. All right. Um, so can, here's another one. Um, yeah. All right. So there's a question about, can we please give an overview specifically about what the task force is doing on the island. Uh, why did we create a group? Uh, that's the thing that people are most uh, interested in. Yeah, uh, Eric, before we get to that, there are a few more questions specifically for Dr. Copeman. There's okay. one that asks if he's familiar with Judy Mikovits book, Plague of Corruption, Restoring Faith in the Promise of Science. 
And if so, what is your perspective on her views? You know, um, I unfortunately you know. am not at all familiar with this. Uh, 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 you know, uh, 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 in terms of corruption in, in science, I think there's been some inefficiency in science. I was an epidemic intelligence service officer an acting state epidemiologist in the state of Washington. And, and one of my most dedicated institutions is the Centers for Disease Control. I set up a national epidemiology program in the country of Mexico, a program that continues to this day to be highly successful. And that was with CDC support. And I must say I'm quite disturbed by what has happened uh, 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 in terms of CDC leadership. CDC was originally put in Atlanta so that they would escape a lot of influence from the central government in Washington, DC. Well, they haven't escaped the uh, influence of Washington, DC. Moreover, the CDC has grown so huge that, the, that uh, uh, there are a lot of various uh, scientific foci of of power that have been established within the Centers for Disease Control. And so that, that uh, 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 sometimes they're, they're working to increase their, those, their, their group power rather than when we were with the CDC, it was always a very selfless kind of endeavor for the public good. Uh, there's another question here. Uh, how long do you predict it could take to get a vaccine out to enough people to have herd immunity? Uh, again, um, in terms of the concept of, of herd immunity, uh, uh, if we're talking about completely opening up like we were before the pandemic completely, uh, uh, we have to get a very high percentage. And I'm not sure we can ever reach that high percentage. Uh, 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 you know, uh, it, it's gonna take a while then for, for things to, to go on. It's not gonna be a magical immediate uh, uh, solution to, to this uh, pandemic. Uh, um, but I, it, so I, the other thing is, I really, really think it's really, really bad if we jump too early to, uh, with, with the vaccine, because there is real potential for the vaccine to cause problems if we haven't done all the good science to begin with to make sure there's not gonna be any problems. And if we jump in with a vaccine that creates problems, boy, that's gonna make it very, very long road because it's going to make it difficult for the other vaccines to get accepted and, and for people to accept them. Even right now, the acceptance of vaccination is not very high. Um, all right, someone is asking, <clears throat> are we hoping to have voluntary local tracking on the island if the Florida DOH doesn't follow through? Uh, I don't think anyone's getting organized to do that. Do you want anything to say anything on this, Eric? Well, it's no, a I don't think we can legally do it. I think yeah, we... it's a difficult thing because one of the things we found out is that um, unless you are the Department of Health, people aren't very cooperative with you. <laughs> um, you know, so, and, and, you know, even the Department of Health has had some trouble in getting, um, um, information from folks um, so that it's a particularly difficult challenge. We have talked about that, um, but honestly, that's one of the areas where we haven't gotten a lot of traction. Um, um, okay, it, it looks like the other uh, questions could be answered by anyone on the task force. Yeah. Um, do we know when they'll be out here testing again on the island? for example. Uh, Sue, do we have any update on that? Uh, they've, uh, the, the county has put out a schedule through the end of September and we're not on it. 
Um, when we talked to them during the testing two weeks ago, they said they could come out if there was a need. So we don't have any definite return date. Okay, here's another, it's not a question really, it's a comment. I messaged my PCP asking her advice on when we, ages 68 and 74, should get our flu shots this year. She advised this year by the end of September, which is a full month earlier than we usually do. That makes sense. Uh, 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 you know, we're very concerned about the interaction overall between influenza and, and coronavirus in terms of creating problems for the, both the health of individuals and for the uh, med medical care organizations. And uh, it's better to get uh, immunity early to the flu uh, so, so that we don't have the, the kind of interactions that could be most harmful. CVS on the island is already offering flu shots. Okay. okay, so it looks like uh, somebody is suggesting that people can monitor their own contacts. You know, if you, if you test positive, I suppose, you can monitor, uh, or even before you test positive, you can just remember who you contacted with simply by writing down on their paper calendar or entering under notes on your phone the date where you've been, who you've been with. So. So that's so you personally can let them know um, that if you have been exposed. Okay, so, um, so it looks like that's all the questions. We, I had one that um, looks like it was a private message, but I, I, I think it's intended to be um, for everyone. Um, just asking what, what we're specifically doing uh, as the task force. So I want to make clear, <laughs> we, we're an ad hoc group. We, we don't have any real authority um, to make anybody do anything. Um, so we have tried to just facilitate conversations. Um, we've written to um, elected officials. We've uh, talked to um, stores and things like that and try to advocate for um, putting these um, these measures in place that would uh, would help with uh, keeping the transmission of the virus down um, the things that you hear talked about all the time wearing masks uh, maintaining social distance uh, avoiding large groups um, and if you do uh, attend um, an event that outside is better than inside. Um, and we have uh, tried to be in contact with all the civic associations and advocate for um, uh, encouraging businesses to adopt these, um, uh, these guidelines. Uh, and so we're in the process of that. Um, Dr. Copeman has done a couple of interviews um, with local news and um, uh, what am I forgetting guys? Somebody jump in here. I think, I think Claudia, Claudia has a question there. Claudia, if you just unmute yourself. I don't have a question. Oh. I want to recommend this book to everybody. This is the book that George W. was reading that caused him to set up the task force. It's called The Great Influenza, The Story of the Deadliest Pandemic in History. It starts off, this is the pandemic in 1918, the Spanish flu. But he also talks about the birth of modern medicine and probably highlights a lot of what's going on behind the scenes that Dr. Koopman is, I'm sure, know, aware of what's going on. Um, I learned a lot and it, it was excellent. A lot of the things that were happening back then are happening now. Um, and like I said, I read it like it was, I couldn't put it down. It was awesome. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you, Claudia. Thanks, Claudia. Um, I, I want to make a couple comments about what else the task force is doing. <clears throat> um, I think a couple things is we've, we've printed up flyers, um, thanks to Eric and his, his printing system, uh, services, um, where we're um, handing those out at local library or mini libraries. They're basically CDC guidelines on how to take care of yourself 
if you think you might have COVID and, and can't get to a doctor or, or don't aren't able or, or don't go to a doctor. Um, we also are including those with um, some of the food pantry services around the island. We're trying to keep an eye on, on need, financial need. Um, I think the food pantries have been very active. Um, we're also tr trying to coordinate the local services pr primarily through the Beacon to identify people who have COVID related financial need and hook them up with the appropriate places where they can get some help. All right. Um, are there any other questions that we didn't answer? You can just um, you can either put them in the chat or you can just go ahead and uh, hit your space bar and pull down your space bar and ask the question. Uh, thanks, guys. Uh, we got to get going. We got a long agenda. Uh, All right. Appreciate it. I think that went really well. I, I like the way this Zoom thing works. We have 34 participants right now. And uh, there may be whole families huddled around the, the screen watching. So it could be more than that. But thanks again. I'll talk to you Monday. Uh, am I still being heard? Yes. Okay. Go ahead. Um, our next uh, presentation is by uh, the president of Conch Marine, uh, Dan Stovall. And uh, he's representing a... Uh, an applicant to build a uh, 978 square foot boathouse at 3737 San Carlos Boulevard, St. James City, and they need a variance. Uh, Dan, I, I consider a friend and uh, we've had some business relationships in the past. So I've asked our vice president Nadine to take over this part of the program. Hi Dan, how are you doing today? I'm doing fine, how are y'all? All right, good. I'm going to ask Helen to, oh, she looks like she's just ahead of me and she's got the screen over to you. So if you want to go ahead and make your presentation, go ahead. Um, I, actually, oh. I, I, I don't. Um, That's okay, Helen. Just we're not, that way. I, I sent you a request to start your video. Um, can you start your video so we can see your face? Okay. Sure, I'm, I'm learning as I go here. Okay. Does your video is stopped. Okay. Although I've lost where you, you are. It, it's telling me my video is stopped and I'm, like I said, I'm, I'm in. Okay. I'm in so video. look in the lower, uh, lower left hand corner of your screen. Mm -hmm. And it should, there should be a video icon with a red slash through it and just hit that. And it ought to start, stop the, start the video. It's like a little movie camera. Bottom left uh, corner of your screen. You, you got to yeah, drag I'm, your I'm, pointer down I'm there. I'm pressing it and yeah, I'm, you know, I'm on my cell phone. Oh, okay. Oh, and if you're on your cell, then we probably can't um, see you on video. So can you just I mean, go I, ahead? I, I can just. Yeah, I can describe it in principle. I mean, it's a fairly simple concept on, on what we're doing, if that'll work for you. But um, Mr. Slender has a has a dock that we uh, we constructed about a year or so ago, and um, it's out on a natural water body out behind his home. And it's it's a two boat slip dock, uh, two side by side um, boat lifts that are running perpendicular uh, the shoreline. And uh, the county has a code that says that you are allowed to build uh, up to a 500 square foot boathouse roof over each individual slip that's permissible on the property. So if in this particular case, there's two boat slips and uh, if you could get a permit for three boat slips or four boat slips, you would, you would be allowed to have a roof over each one of them. But uh, in this particular case, there's two. Um, so the issue that we, we run into, not only with Mr. Schlender's property, but on, on many others in the area, is that the code was written 30 years ago, and um, boats have changed in the last 30 years, and boat lifts have changed in the last 30 years, and the code doesn't work well for what people are, are, are purchasing and putting behind their homes. So we have a situation here where you have a boat that's over 30 foot long, 
and um, another boat next to it that is, uh, I think he's playing on around 24, 26 foot long. And we are asking that instead of building two individual roofs side by side, um, let's incorporate this into one roof. Okay, so the county code would allow us to build um, two side by side 500 square foot roofs. It makes more sense to us and to a lot of my my um, customers that hey why don't why don't we try to put this into one singular roof? The profile would be similar to the allowable two roofs, and there's some cost savings of having to build one truss system rather than two truss systems. But in general, it just it's just something that makes common sense. So. That's what we're asking the county to do is um, forego their code of two individual 500 square foot roofs and build one individual roof um, that's around a thousand square feet. I think we have it. We have it at 978. Um, so I mean, it's it's going to be a standard trust roof like you see. I built all over the island. Um, some people are familiar with trust roofs and I'll also, also what is a common site is the the canvas boat canopies um the boat canopies do not require a permit in uh in lee county but the trust boathouse roofs do and um you know it's 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 a very simple concept some trusses uh plywood sheeting um in this case uh some metal roofing material to match what's already in his backyard he does have a little bit of an unusual backyard where they're is a boathouse area we call it a boathouse because it's it is a living area directly behind his pool between his pool and uh the mean high water line so we're just trying to keep everything congruent there um and so we have a variance process through the county that we go through and part of that is uh just presenting this to uh everyone in the community which is why i'm here so um if you guys have any questions i'd i'd love to i'd love to hear address them um, okay. Dan, there's a question coming in from Jeffrey Waller. Uh, what was the original rationale for the 500 square foot maximum boathouse roof 30 years ago? I, you know, I don't completely know that answer. I think at that point in time, they were trying to follow um, an aquatic preserve rule. You know, there's, there's different um, levels of permitting and water bodies around Pine Island Sound. You have of sovereign submerged water bodies, you have aquatic preserved water bodies, you have man-made canals. My guess is that 30 years ago there was a rule in place um, where you were only allowed to have a 500 square foot maximum roof on a natural water body. Uh, that is no longer the case. Um, it is sovereign submerged lands where Mr. Schlender owns his property, however it is not an aquatic preserve. And because it is not an aquatic preserve, uh, we are allowed to build up to 2,000 square feet of overwater structure without any special permits. We actually have a pathway of getting uh, more square footage should we ask for it, but um, we're not. And uh, 2,000 square feet or less uh, is what we're looking for. Um, so that, that would be my guess is why the county was just trying to follow um, the state's guidelines and which we are we I have a permit in hand we have a permit in hand from the state for this structure uh, we are we're at the county level now which is uh, what we're trying to address so a um, couple of questions um, first one what's the total boathouse um, it's 978 is that correct uh, I believe so 978 it's around 29 foot 6 inches wide which is what's parallel to shoreline and 35 feet long, which is what's running perpendicular to shoreline. And what is the size of the structure currently? Well, there is no roof over the dock at the moment. There is a dock in place. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's got all kinds of shapes to it, but it's a two boat slip dock. Okay. Um, and then somebody else is asking, is it correct that you want to raise, uh, I think the dock three feet higher than what is allowed at this time? Is that accurate? No, it's, it's, the, it's the roof. Okay, so there is another code in Lee County 
that uh, the roof can be a maximum of 20 feet above mean high water. And when you put this into an individual singular roof, just a 412 pitch on it makes it taller than that 20 feet. So it would be our guesstimation before engineering around 23 feet above mean high water. And that is also part of the variance you're correct. Mm -hmm. And are there any other uh, variances requested? It's, so it's the size of the roof uh, and the area it covers and the height of the roof. Um, anything else? To my knowledge, that's it on this one. Okay. You mean on this one as opposed to other docks you're working on, right? Correct. Correct. Okay. And then just one question, are there any seagrass issues? Um, I'm assuming not because it's already a dock, but I just would like to know. Yeah, no, we actually had what's called a benthic survey done where we hire um, a specialist to come in, dive the site and produce a survey. Uh, and that survey indicated there was no sea grasses underneath the boat slips. Okay, great. And just to clarify, somebody's asking, um, was there, there, there was no roof prior to this. Is that correct? There was no roof on the overwater portion of the dock prior to this. That is correct. But there is a roof on the not overwater portion? This is a unique property, yes. There, there is a living area that is technically over the water, but inside we would call the shoreline of the property. That there's, this, is, this is a property that's probably been around, and this was probably created back in, I'm gonna say the 60s, where somebody actually dug a, what we would refer to as a cut in boat slip. So they, they dug into the land, a slip for somebody to park their vessel. And at some point in time, they enclosed that into a living quarters many years ago. Um, so there is a structure that, although technically is over the water, is inside the plane of the shoreline, if that makes any sense. It does, thank you. And then how does the roof impact riparian rights or visually um, aspects of the neighbors? The, the roof, there's a, another code in Lee County that uh, requires that a roof is either 10 feet or 25 feet off the riparian line. Um, the 25 foot code is for natural water body, which this one is in, 10 foot is for a man-made canal. Um, this is inside the 25 foot setback, uh, but the neighbor to, I believe we would call that the um, Northwest uh, has signed a setback waiver. So we, we don't need to seek a variance for that portion of it. All right, um, any other questions? Oh, wait, a couple more coming in. Hold on just a second. Uh, someone says it blocks the sunset. Okay. Um, and Jeffrey Waller's asking, if we endorse this requested variance, does that open up Pandora's box on future variance requests? Um, I think that's a question for Scott. Um, and Jeff goes on to say, my uneducated bias is to change the boathouse roof limitations at the county level versus granting variances. I just don't know the rationales for the 500 square foot limitation and don't feel qualified uh, to opine on granting a variance. Um, and Tom Schlender, who owns the property, says he thinks it will look better with one roof constructed the same as the existing versus two separate roofs. And he's trying to make it look as good as possible with it being right on San Carlos Bay and to match the existing boathouse in the best way possible. The visual aspect would look considerably better than two as it would match the current roof. Um, thank you, Tom. Uh, across the street neighbor says it doesn't affect his view of anything. Um, and someone is asking, is anybody attending this meeting that will be living near this structure? And I can answer that two people have already weighed in and said they're, they're one person said it will block the sunset and another person says it's fine.
All right. I think I'm going to call it and say that's it. Um, any last final questions? Anything else you want to say, Tom or Dan? Yeah, I think I think the the one comment I would like to mention is that even if we were not um, granted the variance, the homeowner would probably seek the two individual roofs side by side so that he can cover his boat. Um, and so the the profile of the roof is going to be similar either way. I mean, a, an argument could be made that it will be several feet taller than if they are two individual roofs. Um, I think if if I was living next door looking across, I, I, if you looked at both of them constructed side by side, you would have a similar appearance as uh, one individual roof. So that's just one comment I'd like to make. All right, thank you. But, uh, um, Scott, do you yep, want to- Thank you guys, I appreciate it. Thank you. Hello, well, Dan. Uh, we usually ask the, uh, the membership, whoever's here, I guess we have 26 members of participants how they feel about it to uh do, should we take a poll or not it might be easiest just to ask people who are um opposed to write opposed in the chat box and then we can count them up afterward All if right. that if that works works for me we're running late okay thanks dan i'll let you know how the chat box All right, goes my chat yep. box doesn't work thank, thank you all i sure appreciate it who said that? I, this is Linda Cutney. I said, I can't get the chat box to accept any comments. Um, okay, well, do you have, do you want to just weigh in now? And we'll count that um, when we're counting up the opposed? Sure. Um, I'm opposed. Okay. That's my husband, right? Yeah, two of us. Well, yeah. What's we'll your go. husband's okay. name, Linda? Uh, Edward Cutney. Okay. Do you want to say something? Say something. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, I, I can't get it to, this is Claudia, and I can't get it to, upset, uh, to accept either, and I'm opposed. I'm wondering, I couldn't ask the question, how would a hurricane wind go for the larger roof as opposed to the smaller? Um, Dan, are you still on or have you signed off? No, no, I'm still here. Um, either way, they're, they're engineered structures. Uh, the, the Florida building code applies to both of them, so there would be no difference as far as the hurricane goes. All right, is there anybody else who can't get the chat box to work who can't um, weigh in that way? We'll, we'll take your vote um, audio, audio, on audio. Do we play these chat boxes back or do we lose them when we, uh, are they part of the recording? Uh, yeah, I I have um, enabled uh, this thing called Save Chat, and I hope yeah. it saves the entire. Okay. Because I'm just looking at this, and it's pretty well close to tied. Uh, um, so if you want to vote, vote. So you know, uh, Scott, if you want to, you can have a voice uh, uh, vote. You can just go down the list of people just to make sure. Well, it's just because we're, we're so late right now. I mean, it's, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. it's almost quarter of eight. We still got a number yeah. of uh, okay. things to do. Um, Sherry, you still with us? Unmute. Sherry is there. Sherry, you need to unmute. Do we have a God button where we can just talk to her? <laughs> there she is. Got me? Okay. Uh, uh, treasurer's report, please. Uh, since we haven't had a meeting since March, um, I'm going to kind of condense several months here. Uh, since March, we have had income of $150 in dues. On the expenses, we've had $61.25 to the Florida Department of State for registration. We've had $710 uh, expense for the Philadelphia Directors and Officers Insurance. We have had $958 in expenses to Rotzel for incorporation and miscellaneous attorney fees. And we have had to uh, uh, Mazurkowitz for incorporation and feasibility study, $1,575 for total expenditures 
since March of $3,304.25, leaving our checking account balance of $2,635.46. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Nadine, I see you put the minutes up, but the, well, I'm seeing the chat box. I don't see the minutes in the previous meeting. Okay, I put the minutes up now um, on screen share. Okay. Excuse me, did you want to approve those uh, minutes? No, I don't think we have to. It's just a report. The financial report. Right. Okay. Uh, okay, the minutes are up for people to look at. Uh, I'll give you a second, but uh, without objection, I, I'd like the minutes to be approved. So move the minutes be approved. Okay. I second. Any objections? Without objection, the minutes are approved. Um, taking minutes myself while I'm doing this is oh, juggling here. Somebody uh, doing this. The water testing at Tropical Point Beach. Uh, some time ago, the GPICA uh, donated $500 to the Calusa Water Trust, uh, Water Keepers, I'm sorry. And uh, that was to do water testing out of Tropical Point Beach. We tried to get the county to do it, but they wouldn't. We'd had a high reading out there previously so we've done three tests there, uh, starting in June, I think. And uh, the first test came back, and it's called an end endocosi test, endococci test. It's like the coliform test for fresh water, only this is what you use in salt water. And 70, uh, a count of 70 per 100 milliliters of water is safe. Anything less than that is fine. The first test came back as 31. The next one came back as 41, so we thought we were in pretty good shape. Then Friday, I went out there by 11.30, and there was a, a young woman with uh, four kids. I'd say they aged in age from 10 to 14, and they were sitting in the water and splashing. They were literally up to their neck in water. And uh, I took the test, and we got it back on Monday, and it's 243 parts. That's almost four times the uh, recommended level. If the county had been doing this, they would have had to come back within 24 hours and test again. And if it was over 70, they would have had to shut the beach. So I'm going back out there on Friday. We'll do another water test. And uh, the test is 65 bucks a pop. We've done three, so we've got three or four left before we run out of money. Um, hopefully the county or the Florida Department of Health will, will see the light. This place is a public beach. It's owned by Lee County. It has a sign up telling you what you can do, what you can't do, but they don't care. <laughs> they don't care. They're not going to test. And uh, now we've got a very dirty level of water out there. So I'm going, tomorrow I'm going to write a letter to the county commissioners and just inform them of what the test was and ask them to keep up or uh, start monitoring. Again, we've done this before. Uh, so that's Trey. Anybody have any questions? Can you get a sign that we can put up when it's over? No, we don't have the right to do that. And if we, we don't want to take responsibility either. I mean, I don't want to tell somebody that water is safe and then have them get sick at the same time. Normally, yeah. normally yeah. Florida Department of Health does that, um, but they yeah. normally want state testing. Yeah, John Cassani, I don't know if you know him. He's the Calusa water keeper. So he, he uh, wrote, wrote an email to them with the test results. Uh, on Monday or Tuesday. So they're aware, I, they haven't responded as far as I know. Yeah, I'm sure he would tell me. So, but the, the county commissioners can do it too. And uh, we'll just try to keep the pressure on until something happens, probably until somebody gets sick. Okay, uh, last night there was a public hearing, much like we did with Dan, uh, to build a 110 foot Doppler radar pole in St. James City. Now this pole is, uh, across the street in a vacant field uh, just before coming from here, just before you get to the uh, St. James City Fire Station. And uh, they showed some pictures of it. I don't know if I could share them with you. Um, but I can, I don't know, let me show you. Let me just show you. I don't know if this is gonna work. Um, can you see that? <laughs> Does that can, can I get on this big screen, Helen, with this? Uh, I, I'm seeing you. 
Yeah, hold on a second. Um, um, if you try to text the picture to me, I'll, I'll try to put it up in the chat. Okay. Well, that's, there's several. That's better. Um, uh, <laughs> here, I lost my little thing to, uh, yeah, it's not going to work. <laughs> I spotlighted you. I yeah, spotlighted you. Hold it up again. Show you the, I don't know if this is if this will work, but okay. Well, backwards too, but that's the side of the Doppler. I don't know if you can see where the fire station is, but you get Hold the you get steady. the trip. Hold you it get steady. The okay. And uh, it looks pretty close to the road. Does it have a dimension on how close it is to the road? I think it's a hundred feet. They don't have any dimensions on it. I don't know if this will work either, but that's a mock-up of what it's going to look like. You see, it looks like a big water tower. Oh yeah. That's 110 feet in the air. They need a variance because the county only allows structures of 90 feet. Uh, but on the, under the Pine Island plan, they can only have 45 feet for mean uh, low water. So they need they need a variance from both, and they want 110 feet. That is the camel's nose in the tent. I mean, if somebody can have 110 feet to do this, they can have it for anything else. Now they they actually bought uh, the weatherman out from uh, from Wink News. That's who's building this is Wink, and uh, he said that they needed this to fill in some gaps in their coverage, and uh, also we'd be able to tell the size of raindrops. I don't know why we need to do that, but uh, I, I was I was pretty disappointed. Uh, we uh, one of the audience members asked them if they could uh, do the hearing on Zoom because only seven people plus Paulette showed up. You know, we're all wearing masks and it was difficult. And uh, the woman who was organizing it said, "No, the county won't allow Zoom." Well, we know that's not true because we just had a Zoom, and I was pointed out to them, and they basically shut me up. <laughs> and that happened more than once that night. And uh, Jeffrey was there too, Jeffrey Waller. Uh, I don't know if he wanted to say anything. He just put his thumb up. Um, but it was it was pretty contentious. And, and my feeling is that, that we should oppose it. Uh, I, I want the best weather prediction we can get. And that's what this is for, weather prediction. But we're getting pretty good weather prediction now. Uh, and, I, and, and allowing this is going to open the door for other towers and uh, if 110 feet is good, why not 120? Why not 150? That's just my feeling. Anybody have any comments? Jeffrey, I saw you unmuted. Yes, yeah, Scott. Um, I'd like to take some time offline with you to catch up on this. I'm a new resident on Pine Island, only a year. And uh, I went there because I wanted to hear what the proposal was. And, you know, secondly, I personally am uh, concerned about the uh, the microwave emissions coming from that tower impact on health of people, animals, wildlife, et cetera. Um, it's a science that there's a lot of work still going on and it needs more work, but I am concerned about the uh, level of micro radiation with a million watt tower transmitting 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 360 degrees. So I'm trying to learn more about this and I, I'm happy to chat with you a little bit more offline Scott, to bring me up to speed on what's been done in the past on Pine Island. But my general attitude is, as you said, if we make an exception here, we make exceptions, you know, we, again, we open up Pandora's box. And someone asked, you know, why did people oppose the boathouse roof? And I oppose it because I don't feel qualified to make a recommendation to grant the variance because I don't know what all the background was on why the 500 square foot boathouse roof was put in in the first place. Uh, an impact on wildlife views, whatever it is. Um, and here's another example, you, you know, it, it, it was done at 45 feet for a reason. So why would we grant an exception? I think we should study, you know, if we want to raise the level to allow something like this, then change the level. But I'm just, you know, early in terms of trying to understand this and what the impact is. Uh, but the, uh, the energy and electromagnetic waves and microwaves that emanate that I'm concerned about. And I guess I challenge why there isn't a more remote island where it could go, where there are less people. 
I hear you. Hey, uh, anybody have any questions about it? I, I wish that uh, they'd done a uh, Zoom because we got a great uh, turnout Deborah, tonight. Deborah uh, Swisher Hicks said she'd like to speak. If uh, Deborah, yeah. if you want to jump in. Unmute, Hi. Deborah. Okay. Thank you. I, I was there at the meeting last night and I was one of the more vocal people there. So, sorry. Okay, so there's some real quick things that I want to go over so people can consider this. When you're looking at the review and the application and, and the public meeting that was held, it, it's not so much on what they're saying, it's what's missing. Um, some of the things that were stated by Jim Farrell, you know, the, the, the wink weather guy, by the way, I do like him. Um, he stated that we don't have dual polarized uh, radar. Um, I want to challenge on that because according to Mike Gibbons, the general manager and owner of uh, Wink, he states in a uh, article that they use the National Weather Service, which offers dual polarized radar. And, they, and that's what they use and that's what they want to use because it's the best available. Another item is in their uh, right up in their 210 pages to the county. They're only mentioning two of the, the minimum four uh, National Weather Service radars that they, you know, the Dopplers that they have. Uh, there's Key West, which they totally neglect in their, their discussion. There's the Ris Riskin, which is their, they call their Tampa. There's Miami and there's Melbourne. Um, so they're they're missing two. They're only discussing two. Um, one of the larger things that was brought up would had to be the uh, generator that they're going to be having on that site that they don't show on the site plans, and what type of uh, fuel that's going to be used for it, how they're going to store it, and um, how much of of the fuel. So there, there's a lot of things missing on that and then the county doesn't even see that. Uh, they completely denied that there's eagles nests on their, their property when even the county has written to them uh, in a, uh, a recent, you know, let's talk about what you're asking. There are a minimum of two nests on their property and other nests both south, um, east and west of them. Um, and they were very adamant and they even mentioned that Eagles wouldn't have a problem with the Doppler because they have eagle eye. So, you know, and that was a comment made by Mike Gil Gil Gilson, the manager. Um, there's also, um, they would not discuss what the future use of that tower is going to be because once we all know, once the tower goes up, we have no control whatsoever of what goes on it afterwards. So they kept saying, this is only an application for wink, you know, for the um, Doppler. Yeah, that might be what they're stating, but that's not what's happening. You know, you got to look at the bigger picture. Um, and lastly, when you think about uh, the weather events of Southwest Florida, and if it's major, we have already left the area. And um, we don't need to wait to the last minute for that last Doppler to just before it hits our property before we start decide to leave. Uh, we see, we look days ahead, but not minutes ahead. We look to leave, um, and that would be using the Tampa, the Key West, the Miami Dopplers, not our own local. Um, the, the, um, there, there's, there's more. <laughs> They also mentioned that they, one reason why they want to use our island is because it's pristine, that there is no large buildings and, and other, other radio waves to block their, their view if they use their Doppler. And by, by their even stating that, they're, they're using our island for their own means, for their own, you know, for their own, um, what is the word? When, Anyway, one, and once it's up, we have no say. And they already have a Doppler tower that they previously used. And they took down, and it's very hard to see. I tried to highlight it, but it's not there. And this is at their, their site itself. Uh, and they're choosing not to use it because, once again, they want to come to our island. And 
one of the things that they've also done in their previous land is that they fill it up. This is 10 acres here. Uh, and they put one, two, three, four, five towers. Granted, they're not Doppler, but they're, they're more towers. So this is just Pandora's box. So really, I, I think this is something that Pine Island should be very concerned about. It isn't just a simpler, let's see what the weather is going to be like. Um, this, is, this is a larger, larger thing that's going to be coming. Thank you. See, we got a couple of questions here. How tall is the tower compared to the tower at the St. James Fire Station? A lot bigger. I, I don't know how tall St. James is, but I know the one you're talking about. Um, I got a tower out my, my window here that's over by the villas, and I don't know how tall that is, but uh, that looks to be on the scale of what they're trying to put up down there. The only thing is this tower over here it's, it's just that it comes to a point with a light on the top. This thing looks like a giant water tower suspended in the air. Uh, let's see. Many Pine Islanders did not leave until a few hours before Charlie struck. That's true. They left at the last minute after being advised by the local weather stations. It might be a lifesaver. Yeah, you'd, that's really a question you'd have to ask with Jim Farrell. I'm a, I don't know anything about that. I came the year after. Yeah, I can, I can do that, Je Jeff. I, I will forward that email you sent to me to the board. Uh, Nadine, I, I managed to get these pictures through to you uh, on, on uh, a text. Is that, did that go? It says it's delivered. Did you lose Nadine? No, she's there. Oh, okay. Uh, I'll, I'll try to post them. They don't really show much, so I'm not sure they're really going to help too much, but I'll yeah, see if I can uh, get them to post, Scott. Yeah, you have to really climb right up on them. I think they don't show much on purpose. There's a gas tank that they're going to put next to the generator, and uh, that came out during the discussion. That's not on any of the schematics, and they said the reason for that is it's uh, interwoven with the generator. I don't even know what that means. But if you got a gas tank, it should be on the schematics. That's a hazardous uh, situation. It should be on a. It should be on its own pad. Uh, I'll try, Jeff. <laughs> I'm, I, I can't do it. I'll lose the zoom. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, Scott. Maybe you need to take care of that after. Yeah. Meeting. Okay. We need to. Um, all right. Um, I've lost my picture and I don't know how to get it back, but that's all right. Um, do we want to chat on that and uh, and have people vote while I go on to the next item? I'm really rushing along here. It's eight o'clock. I'm sorry. I apologize. Um, do you guys want to chat? Vote. Vote in the chat, do you mean? Yeah, yeah. Vote okay, like everybody go again. to the chat and say yes to the tower or no to the tower. Yeah. We got two against the tower here. Ed and Linda Cutney. Well, just put that in the chat. We'll get two My votes. chat doesn't work. Oh, okay. Sorry. I mean, okay. Uh, so I'm doing two jobs here tonight. I'm yeah. trying to. Take yeah, actually, Scott, I think you could, um, my chat is, is not coming up, uh, allowing me to put anything in either. So I think you could go one by one. Just I, oh, I yeah, I, my, my picture. chat doesn't work either. Scott, how close is this to the preserve? Well, the, the flatwoods preserves on both sides of the road. It's not far, uh, less than a mile. It's not on any of the pictures they showed. <laughs> No. Yeah, well, yeah. And all you have to uh, look at the pictures of this last hurricane that went through Texas, and there's a huge tower, like they're talking, that flew a good distance down the road. Um, somebody... Scott, if you want to call the roll, I can write down who's voting which way. I can't because I, I, I lost my picture, Nadine. Could somebody else? Okay, I could. All right, I'll, I'll call the roll. All right. and... Um, if somebody else wants to take notes, then I will take notes. All right, I'm thank you. Ellen. I will. We just need the final count. Yep. Okay, I'm going to start. 
back here. Uh, John Cawthon. Oh, uh, Helen, you're gonna have to unmute. You're gonna have to unmute everyone. Well, you can th hold your fingers up too. Yeah. Up. He doesn't, he have, doesn't, have, he doesn't have video. So I'm going to try to. Oh boy. Yeah. No, everybody's going to have to unmute manually. Okay. So Claudia Bringe. No. Linda Cutney and uh, Edward Cutney already voted no. Thank you. Uh, Scott? No. Sherry Perkins? No. Debbie Memoli? No. Jeffrey Waller? Both Jeffrey and Lisa vote no. Thank you. And I include our dog Missy, that would be three. <laughs> <laughs> Deborah Swisher? Uh, no, and John Hicks, no. Uh, yeah. And Carl Halk? Uh, Carl, hold up your, hold up a finger, one finger for yes, two fingers for no. All right, thank you. Uh, Mike Downing. Can't hear you either. One finger for yes, two fingers for no. Okay. No, no for Mike Downing. You can see me, I have the camera off. Uh, Sue, Sue's iPad. It's Sue DeHode, no. Thank you. Uh, Paulette, I'm assuming you're not voting and you're muted. <laughs> She's a okay. resident now, though. What's that? She lives on Pine Island. Well, yeah. she can vote if she, she wants vote. to. She can she vote. I, I assume that I'm not a member, so I'm, I'm not able to vote. <laughs> oh, you don't have, have to be a member. <laughs> you know, uh, that doesn't work, Paul. Uh, you don't have to be a member. Work, well. <laughs> you know me, I stay out of everything. All right, <laughs> All right Martha Hoard. David and Martha Heward say no. Heward, thank you. I'm sorry, I mispronounced your name. No, well, that's fine. Uh, Patty, I have no last name for you. Uh, abstain. I'm Matt Lachey. That's okay. all right. Okay. That, that's okay. I would vote yes then. You would vote yes. Okay. Uh, Diane Braun. Um, you're muted. We'll try to come back to you. Let me just make a note. Um, Ellen Ballard, you're also muted. If you could unmute and vote. Diane Braun's a no. Thank you, Diane. Ellen is in, um, she's voting no, because she's on the, I can see her message. Oh, good, thank you, Claudia. And Paul Hogue is also voting no. Thank you, and then I have a Lucy M. No. No. Uh, Aaron L. I'll get back to her, I can text her. Um, and SJC. So All right, city? SJC, if you could either unmute yourself or try to say yes or no in the chat. And John Cawthon. No. SJC votes no? No. Okay, and can we get your name for the record, please? No, thank you. Sorry. Right. Uh, and then John Cawthon, yes or no? Okay, the, someone's in the chat there. Uh, let's see, I've got Sue Ellen and Paul Hogue have all voted no in the chat. Well, those are two extras? Two I think um, they may have weighed in, uh, so. I, I think I missed the vote, I'm a no. Who is okay. you? Who are you? Jim Copeman. <laughs> Oh, Jim. Okay. <laughs> he was talking for 20 minutes. <laughs> I, I think it's it's safe to say um, that uh, everybody is opposed. I think we had one yes. Yeah. Uh, 
and if anybody else has a yes and wants to, um, you can email us at info at gpica.org if you want to weigh in that way. Uh, otherwise, you can try to put it in the chat. So we have 23 no's and one yes. By my count. All right. Th thank you, everybody, for voting. And, uh, you know, thanks for playing along on our Zoom game tonight. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is the last, the last item. Uh, this has been coming up. The, the docks that they're re building, well, they're tearing out some docks, and then they're putting in uh, other docks and be out behind Captain Cons on Bosiller Island. And uh, I spoke with Curtis Hodman of DEP in the first week of August about this. He's handling the permit application for the dock near Captain Cons. Let me just stress, Captain Cons has nothing to do with this dock. He said the marina is planning to tear out as many slips currently by the seawall as will be added by the docks. They want to build there so there will be no increase in the number of slips. I believe it's 50 slips they're looking at. We want to extend the current dock out to 200 feet, which I think is the maximum allowed by Lee County without a variance, and add a second smaller dock. The goal is to put the slips in deeper water so larger boats can tie up. Comments on this phase of the permit process are acceptable through next week, and there will be another phase where comments will be received through most of September. There is no public hearing scheduled for this project, but if there is a lot of public interest in this, they may schedule one, may schedule one. Okay, so if you want to comment, or just be notified of future developments on this permit, which I did, uh, send an email to, uh, I'm gonna say it and I'll spell it if somebody needs it, curtis.hardman at floridadep.gov. curtis.hardman at floridadep.gov. And make sure you reference permit application number 152558-0000. The GPICA hasn't taken any position on this, um, and I don't know if we will. I mean, I, I don't see they don't need a variance, and the, there's no net increase in slips, although they're probably going to be bigger slips. So that's what's going on, folks. Um, any questions on that? Could you put that email in the chat? You know, you know what? In the chat? I Oh, in the chat. Put the uh, email in the chat. I've been avoiding that. Chat. Been yep, I'll, I'll throw it in there. Can we put it on our website too? It's in the email that I sent out. I think. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, let me double check. If not, I've got it in my inbox. I, I think it'd be great if people would just ask to be informed as to what's going on out there. I, of, I think uh, I think I agree, Scott. I think the more people that show an interest, um, will get their attention a little bit more. Yep. Can I make a comment? It's sure. Lucy M. So I live right near Back Bay. This dock that they're going to put in, they say they're taking out the old docks because the seawall is crumbling. Now they haven't said they're going to fix the seawall. It's going to be 200 feet out into Back Bay, which is one of the places the manatee in this area actually breed and birth. They're, they say they're going to put in deep water. There is no deep water. There isn't any deeper water in Back Bay. The grass beds out there will be destroyed and they're planting slips that are twice as big as the slips they have on the shoreline because they want bigger boats. They're calling it a marina now. They are going to then make it bigger. They're gonna put a fuel dock, they're gonna do, this is high tower, and they are the ones who own the land and have been turned down three times for putting 50 houses on that empty piece of property. Now they wanna build this because it's gonna be really easy to sell property once people have docks they can bring their huge boats in. If you've never been out the back bay entrance into the sound, it has got two dead man's curves. We've lost five people in the last two years to boat deaths on those turns. And they want to bring in bigger boats in shallow water. This we found out because a neighbor of that got a piece of paper tacked up on their mailbox. That was the only notice any neighbor in the neighborhood got. And I'm one of them and I never saw any notice whatsoever. This is not only not okay, 
But we have to take a stand. You guys are talking about development on Pine Island. This is huge development in the quietest end of Pine Island. And everybody in Boquilla is opposed. And this is high tower investments coming in to railroad this end of the island. And if I think of the, if the Greater Pine Island Civic Association can't take a stand, then we're gonna have to do it ourselves. And that's all I have to say. I really think you guys need to take a stand for this end of the island. That's all I got, thanks. I, I, I would like to add to that, you know, in terms of this, this little sort of narrow uh, uh, deep water channel out of uh, Back Bay, uh, uh, where, where the boats, and it's not deep, deep water, right? It's just- uh, uh, Probably three or four feet, I guess. And, and, uh, uh, if you put out 200 feet into, into that, it's, it's going to uh, impede. I, I think that's quite a bit. Well, what we- I think we what, ought to take I, a stand on it, Scott. Well, I, all right. Um, can I make a comment? Can I say something to Lucy M? Um, yeah. If that's okay, and I, I don't mean to infringe at all. Um, if you have any proof of what you're saying, please, please call me at the Eagle office so I can interview you and I can get this story out so other people are aware of this. And if you don't, please just write a letter to the editor to make other people aware of this. That would yeah, be we've, we've got 200 pages of stuff we've pulled off the DEP's website on people protesting this already. So I think that they're in trouble and they're going to have to have a public hearing. Because these guys are, they, they're, they hid this. They hid this from the neighborhood until somebody got something posted on the, their mailbox. There are three multi-million dollar houses that just got sold there. Those people knew nothing about this. And now they've all hired lawyers. So this is going to be a fight. And if we don't get behind it as an island, it's just as bad as not getting behind a Doppler radar. Well, how about this? Um, we, we send an email off to uh, Curtis Hartman and tell him we want a public hearing. That's a great idea. That is a great idea. We can do that. I, I would like to say I had a similar thing happen next door to where I was. Next door to where I was. They wanted to put in. They wanted to put in. And, and it ended up being. Ended up being. They they brought in gravel and put it in the bed, ruining the uh, seagrass. Uh, they covered the dock and the square footage that it shaded was about 20 times what the previous dock was. Uh, when they say replacement dock, it doesn't mean anything like what I think replacement dock looks like. I think is an associate. Like, watch, uh, watch this closely and uh, and vote on it. Thank you, Gary. We're, we're getting a lot of feedback on you. Yeah, Paulette. I think we get feedback Paulette's... with you. I keep seeing Paulette. Oh, there's Sherry's head. Okay. Well, without objection, we'll. Uh, Request a uh, public hearing formally from the from uh, the guy who's handling this, Curtis Hardman. Tell him the GPICA met and, uh, without objection. Is it unanimous that we should do this? Okay. Yes. Yep. Yeah, I don't I don't hear any objections, so uh, we'll we'll send that out and uh, I'll CC Paulette. Maybe you can announce that we did that. I don't know. Thank you. Um, okay. And thank you, Lucy, for all your information. Yeah, yes. thank you, Lucy. I, I I had no idea what was going on out there. That, and I'm, and I'm sorry about that. Okay, thank one you. last issue thank here, you. unless there's something else. Uh, update on incorporation. There's really nothing going on. If you read the uh, interview that Paulette did with, with me in the Pine Island Eagle two or three weeks ago, you pretty much know everything's going on. Uh, the county put their thumb on the scale. They gave us bad numbers. Uh, to make it look like we couldn't afford to incorporate. They wanted us to take over the parks, and uh, that was $615,000. They wanted us to spend $164,000 on streetlights and traffic lights. We don't have any. Uh, 
you know, between those two things, we went from a million dollar donor community to a barely break even community. So then they said, well, you guys can't afford to incorporate and we're not going to put uh, the requested non-binding referendum on November's ballot to let the voters decide if they want to incorporate or not. It was just a, it was just a take your pulse referendum and we were going to pay for it, 2,300 bucks and they wouldn't do it. And uh, it was, in fact, uh, Matt Lachey would be broken out by precinct so we could tell how those folks felt. If they, you know, if they were resoundingly against incorporation, we'd, you know, cut them out of the plan like we did with Cape Royal when they voted against it. So right now we're just waiting to see what the new politicians are going to look like. There's an election coming up on November 3rd and, uh, and then try to regroup and decide where we're going from there. But uh, right now there's nothing going on with incorporation. The new feasibility study isn't going to get done. We stopped doing that when we saw the numbers. Any questions? Okay, there being none, I would take a motion for adjourn. Sorry, I kept you guys up. Uh, I submit a motion to adjourn. Nadine, second. Claudia looks like a second. All right, without objection, we're adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you, Scott. And thank you, Helen. Yeah, thank you everybody for staying with us. It's a long meeting. <laughs>